tonight, we welcome Dan Gillespie to Maryland PPA. Uh, he's going to talk about digital uh, color space with digital photography. So, Dan, please um, take it away. Hello, everyone. It's nice to virtually meet you and join you this evening. Um, I figured I would tell you a little bit about myself and then a little bit about what I plan on covering. So I have been a color management consultant professional, professionally as a career for over 20 years now. Um, you know, my background comes from design and creative, but most of my clients are printers. So, and the printing industry is huge these days. It's not just offset, you know, sheet fed presses anymore. Um, lots of inkjet technology, dye sublimation, you know, different kinds of printers and ink chemistries and uh, lots of different materials and substrates and papers and whatnot. So, um, you know, I've uh, kind of well known on the printer side. Uh, they have a certification program over there that I've been uh, a member of for 14 years now. And, you know, I go in and certify these printing companies to print to uh, North American standards. Um, but, you know, my passion lies in photography and stuff too. I have uh, own two professional, you know, photography businesses. One is uh, for 10 years, I had a studio here in Lancaster, Pennsylvania that was purpose built for shooting cars. So should you want to check that out, that business was called Hot Rod Portraits. I do have a presence on Instagram and Facebook uh, and a really old website uh, that you could look at. But that was a white room with a psych wall and you know we had our own process in there for shooting cars. And we were published in several magazines around the, the world. I think 10 different magazines we had features in in three different continents. Uh, I got really tired though of shooting, you know, static objects in a white room. So after that kind of, I let the studio go, um, I transitioned into event photography. So I shoot lots of bands and festivals and concerts and whatnot. Um, the, you know, the photography business is a hobby. Uh, you know, I pursue that evenings and weekends, and I'm a professional consultant. I, uh, I'm the director of technical services for a graphic arts company that's based in Portland, Oregon, but we're nationwide. Uh, we are an Epson Pro Graphics dealer. So I don't know how well you know the Epson printers, but they sell four different series um, with different inks in them for different markets. And we sell three of the four. So we sell all the flagship Epson printers for photography and proofing, you know, as well as their solvent ink printers, which are for, you know, signage and outdoor stuff. So, you know, if you have any questions about Epson printers in particular, I've been an Epson dealer for 20 years and, uh, you know, I know these printers inside and out. So, um, so I've got, you know, I don't have a canned presentation. I hate sitting and watching, you know, somebody just read through slide decks. So I'm not doing that. Uh, this is going to be all riffing and demonstrating for you all these concepts. So, you know, before we get started, um, you know, you probably already know that color management is highly technical and quite confusing. Um, so, you know, you need to understand the theory of what's going on under the hood and how it all works uh, to understand what you need to do for yourselves to make it work. Um, you know, I will be talking about creating, uh, and you, I don't know how many of you have created a, a profile of a monitor or a printer in your lives. Okay. So, you know, of course, uh, that's a start. How many of you have created a profile of your camera? Okay, there's several people that have. So we'll get into the nitty gritty of some of that stuff, but we got to lay the groundwork first. You know, uh, there's a, a huge percentage of photographers that, you know, they just don't need the color accuracy that, uh, uh, a custom camera profile might, might, you know, get them. Um, 
you know, they're happy with if they're shooting landscapes or they're shooting portraits or whatever, as long as they're happy with the color and their customers are happy with the color, you know, then it's all good, right? Uh, <clears throat> we'll certainly talk a lot about how to print your files properly, how to soft proof your images properly so that you know what it's going to look like before you print it. Um, but in terms of the camera profiling stuff, you know, it's really important to realize where that's a necessity. You know, if you're shooting product, um, you know, or a fine art, uh, and you're trying to reproduce, you know, that item or that, you know, original piece as faithfully as possible, uh, with as little color correction as possible, then a, a good camera profile is the answer. So, you know, I'm not suggesting that, you know, you can't get a hold of your color management in some areas, uh, but maybe you don't need to do the full blown, you know, effort. Uh, so it's all dependent on, you know, what kind of clients you have, what kind of work you do. Um, so I'm just going to dig right in and start talking to you about ICC profiles. So I think, you know, hopefully you've all are familiar with uh, the term ICC profile. Um, the ICC is, it's an acronym, it's International Color Consortium. This was a group of companies like Microsoft and HP and Apple who got together in the 90s and kind of brainstormed on a way to define devices so that those definitions could be plugged into softwares and those softwares could, you know, convert our images intelligently. So <clears throat> the ICC has come a long way. Um, the technology from, you know, its inception to now is, you know, uh, really, really interesting. Um, they've had different versions of ICC profiles over the years and have just released version five profiles. The version five profiles, you know, offer things that you can save into the profile that, uh, you know, most software program, like even Photoshop and Lightroom are not even equipped to handle yet. So for the most part, we'll be talking about either version two or version four profiles. Um, but I want you to see what this looks like. So I'm just going to share my desktop. I'll, I'll warn you now that I have lots of icons on my desktop, but I did clean them up a little bit for you. So, you know, above all else, you know, I want to uh, have fun and, uh, you know, teach you guys some really important, cool stuff here. So I'm first going to go into uh, an ice, uh, a program called color think. So, you know, living in an RGB world, like we do as photographers, you're probably have heard the term sRGB or Adobe RGB 1998 or pro photo RGB. And you wonder like, what are these things? And what's the difference between these things? You know, where do these come from? Um, so all of those profiles, are man-made. <laughs> they weren't measured from a particular device. They were created in the computer. So they're like perfect color spaces. And, you know, uh, regardless of what kind of digital camera you have, you usually have the ability to tag your images with one of the two of sRGB or Adobe RGB 1998 it's really not doing anything to the raw file. Um, it would put that, if you're also saving a JPEG, it would put the JPEG in that color space and tag it appropriately. When I say tag, uh, you could also say embedded. So that ICC profile would be tagged to the image or embedded in the image. Um, <clears throat> but once you get into you know, your raw files and developing your raw files in Lightroom or, you know, Capture One's, Phase One's Capture One product, um, you're overriding that choice right off the bat anyway. So, 
uh, the tagging of the color space within the camera is kind of, you know, especially if you're only doing a raw workflow like I do, I don't shoot JPEGs. It really is a totally, it doesn't matter whatsoever. So, um, and I'll show you that, but I, wanted, I want to use this application here. This, this application is called Color Think. And this application lets us open ICC profiles and look at them in three dimensions and compare one profile to another profile. So, um, you know, you've probably heard terms like uh, gamut or uh, color space. <clears throat> and these ICC profiles define the gamut or the color space of particular devices. And you can create ICC profiles for all of your devices. There are ways to create profiles for cameras, for monitors, for printers, for scanners, for projectors, for tablets, for phones. You can create an ICC profile of basically any device. And it is, operates as a fingerprint of that device. It shows you how bright the brights get, or whites get, what color the whites are, how black the blacks get, if the blacks are neutral or, you know, tinted, uh, what kind of overall saturation and, uh, you know, color gamut you're capable of either capturing or reproducing on that file. So, you know, we'll, we'll get into talking about the difference between RGB color spaces and CMYK color spaces because there are different kinds of devices. So the RGB profiles are, <clears throat> are you know, uh, for light devices that work with light and the CMYK profiles are ink on paper. So, you know, at some point, if we're gonna print our images, we've gotta convert from RGB to CMYK someplace and we'll talk a lot about where to do that, how to do that, and so on. So first of all, let's take a look here at ColorThink software. I'm, I've got a bunch of profiles already added in here that I'm gonna turn off. And there's one other one that I wanna add in. So here's the sRGB profile. And I don't know if you've ever had a chance to like visualize what this looks like, but we're looking at this RGB profile in LAB. So LAB is device independent. LAB is like the master color space and all RGB and CMYK color spaces live within LAB. So we're looking at this RGB color space. So you'd have to imagine that uh, there's, there's like a axis running right through the middle of this profile right where the tip is, right here. So from the, the pure white down to the bottom to the pure black, there is a, a, an L axis that runs right through there. So everything in the middle of the color space has no color. It's all black and white. As you get further away from the center, that's where your saturated colors are around the very far outside. So if we're looking straight down on this, you can see Here's red, here's magenta, here's blue, cyan, yellow and green are up here. Green, yellow. So where that peaks is the solid colors. And then you have the tonality and stuff around. So around the outside would be the most chromatic or saturated colors that would define the gamut of this color space. So when we take a look at this sRGB color space, you're like, okay. I see that, what am I literally looking at though? So, you know, when you're talking about this in terms of let's say printing, and you're like, you know, is this color space appropriate for my printing device? So I'm gonna add another profile in here. This profile is of a printing machine. This is the Epson, I think I put it in here. Hold on, let me just go to the desktop. I got all the profiles right here. So this is the brand new, the latest model from Epson. This printer has cyan, magenta, yellow, black ink, has light cyan, light magenta ink, 
has light, light black and light black ink, but it also has orange and green and violet ink. So it's really, it has 11 ink cartridges, but it's a seven color printer. So we can print a huge gamut with this printer. And we need to make sure that we're preparing our RGB images <coughs> such that we are taking advantage of that and not cutting ourselves off at the knees. So I'm gonna go down here and choose uh, one of these premium photo glossy, like here's premium luster. So that's one of their you know, most popular photographic papers for these printers. I'm gonna open this up and show you the size of this, of this gamut. So <clears throat> just to make you see this a little better, I'm gonna turn it red. So you can see how much of that is sticking out from sRGB. Now, if I have my image in sRGB, that means that none of the pixels in my image can go outside the boundary of the ICC profiles gamut. So, and I'll show you further that you can actually drag images in here and it plots all the pixels in the image and you can see that they're restrained to the color space that they're in. So what I'm really, one of the things I'm really trying to point out is that RGB is not just one thing. CMYK is not just one thing. We have to, you know, appropriately choose. There's literally, I don't know how many, infinite number of different RGB color spaces and different CMYK color spaces. So it gets really granular. You know, we have to know these definitions uh, so that we can prepare our images properly. But what are we looking at here? We're looking at the sRGB uh, color space versus a new Epson printer. And you can see that the Epson printer can print a huge gamut compared to sRGB. So if I'm preparing my image in sRGB, all the pixels stop where the sRGB boundaries are. So there are no pixels out in these areas to take advantage of all the color the printer could print. Does everybody with me here? Yep. So obviously, when you look at it like this, you know for sure sRGB is not the color space I want to be using for printing images to my Epson printer. Now, if that was just a typical four color printing press, I have a profile in here um, and the, there's standard profiles for the printing industry. So if I go to open <clears throat> profiles, one of the standards is swap. Here is swap. And this is kind of close to the default setting in Photoshop for CMYK working space. And we'll go over all the Photoshop color settings, but the default CMYK color space in Photoshop is a 25 year old version of this profile or this standard. <coughs> um, why Adobe hasn't changed it, we'll talk about that when we get to, when we get to the Photoshop stuff. But I'm gonna open this CMYK color space and I'm gonna turn off the Epson. So even in this scenario, now when you look at it in two dimensions, it looks like sRGB pretty much covers the swap 2013 uh, ICC profile or color space, right? You say, oh, well, I'm not losing anything here. But if you look over around the side, you see this chunk hanging out. So if, again, if I turn that red or green, turn that a different color, you can see that in the fact that you're not covering all of it. So again, your image would have the pixels limited right to this boundary, but the printer is able to print out here and you're just not giving the printer the information to take advantage of those colors that they could print for you or that the printer could print for you, whether it's the company or the actual machine. Hey, Dan. Yep. 
Um, so, you know, I, maybe it's a little off topic, but a lot of us print through labs. Um, are our labs using printers that are like that new Epson you referred to? Are we sending them files that are, you know, not taking full advantage of what they're capable of doing? A lot of times, yes. Um, you know, I'm familiar with some of the local labs here in PA. I have a bunch of photo lab customers. Um, and, you know, some of the bigger ones that you guys might use as well. And, you know, I'm familiar with the systems that they use too. So I know that in the beginning, you know, this is going back, you know, at least maybe let's say 10 years, that a lot of these photo labs used a Fuji system. And the software for the Fuji system only accepted sRGB images. Uh, and that was a limitation of the software that was driving that printer, not really the printer itself. Now, in subsequent versions of that printer, the software then would support any embedded profile as source. Um, so, but yeah, and you know, a lot of these photo labs, though, have moved away from die sub or, you know, actual, you know, ex uh, uh, continuous tone uh, photographic prints to inkjet prints. Now, the photo lab that's right here in town has a 10-year-old Epson. So their 10-year-old Epson, you know, doesn't have, you know, the green and orange and violet ink in it. So you know, they're not going to be able to print your stuff as colorful as a lab that did have a new Epson. So it's really important. And sometimes you just have no way of knowing, you know, sometimes you're using a website or something where you're uploading or an app on your phone or whatever, and it's just requiring you to do whatever they say. <clears throat> um, right. but, you know, a popular one is, uh, what is it? Oh, blurb. I don't know if you've had used blurb for, uh, you know, getting any books printed or anything like that, but, you know, even the documentation and what they tell you to do on their website is just flat out wrong. But um, Dan, may yeah. I say, the, the, um, the software that we use, which you haven't gotten to, is limited in the color space. For instance, we output from Photoshop for, and we can't, as I understand it, the color space of Photoshop will not allow you to use all of the color space of the Epson printer you just showed. Oh, that's not true at all. And I'll show you in Photoshop how you can control what profiles you want to use. So, so in uh, photo printing labs, not I'm, I've printed the blurb and I understand the limitations there, but like um, White House or Bay Photo, they're probably using pretty current Epson printers. Um, they still ask you to submit in either RG, sRGB or Adobe RGB. And, and I know that they have ICC profiles available, but I'm, how do we use those to determine how to submit? Are you going to get to that by any chance? Yep. Yep. I will cover that. Yep. So, but this is the way to the theory behind what's capable, what's possible. You know what I mean? So if they gave you a profile of their Epson, now, if they could just tell you what the, what the Epson was, then you could download a profile, you know, from Epson's website and utilize that. Um, but as if I were the lab, I would not be using canned profiles. I, canned meaning they came from the manufacturer. I would be measuring and creating custom profiles on my Epson printer that were of the best quality. And then I would put those on my website or, you know, have them readily available for people like you who need to soft proof to those profiles uh, so that they're sharing their capabilities and the definition of their capabilities with you. And you can plug those right into any softwares you're using to see the results of what those are, will, will yield. <clears throat> so just as a for instance here, I'm going to turn that CMYK profile off. I've still got the sRGB profile here. I'm going to turn the Epson profile back on where we could see it was way bigger than sRGB. But is it way bigger than Adobe RGB? It is. So let's go turn our off sRGB or let's, I'll leave that on for now and we'll turn on Adobe RGB. So you can see here still 
huge chunks of the printer sticking out. You see that? This is from the blue range all the way over to the green range. And it's mostly mid-tone to shadow range colors. If I turn this back to single color, oh, excuse me, not that one. If I turn the Epson profile back to sing or true color, you'd see what color range that was in, right? So you got blues over here to the right through cyans over to greens. So it's that range, you know, th there's a huge chunk that's still sticking out of Adobe RGB. Th the problem is, is that, you know, you think or people think <laughs> that the photo lab knows what they're doing and knows about color management. Chances are unequivocally not. And they just, they just don't know any better, you know? So by them telling you to submit your files in sRGB or ProPhoto RGB, or excuse me, sRGB or Adobe RGB 1998, you are throwing away color that that printer could have printed. No ifs, ands, or buts. This is the proof right here. And it's not just on the green to blue side. Look at on this side here. Yellows, all the way over to reds. You know, this whole section here that's sticking out is all colors that you could print as long as there was pixels there to print. But if you're using Adobe RGB, all your pixels are slammed into that boundary. <clears throat> you don't have any pixels in your image that go out that far. So this is the argument then that comes up for ProPhoto RGB. So now let's look at ProPhoto RGB. Bam. So I'm gonna turn off sRGB and I'm gonna turn off Adobe RGB. And I'm gonna come down here to ProPhoto and I'm gonna reduce the opacity of it so you can see through that gamut to the Epson gamut. Aha! Now I've got a color space that isn't clipping any of my output space. So you, they refer to these profiles as source and destination or input and output. So the RGB profile would be the source or input profile. The CMYK Epson printer uh, profile would be the destination or output profile. So, you know, just this, what have we been talking for 25 minutes? Just this knowledge right here is the theory of color management. You know, you have to know what these color spaces are shaped like, what size they are, and what the capabilities of your printing machine are. So, for instance, in the two CMYK instances that I showed you, one was a seven color inkjet printer, the other was a four color offset printing press. You know, you'd see a lot less difference going from sRGB to the printing press than you would going sRGB to the Epson. The Epson would just, you know, I mean, you're cutting off half of the color that it could reproduce. So, are we winning here yet, or what? Are you like, whoa? So right there is a perfect argument for using ProPhoto RGB over sRGB or Adobe RGB. Certainly, I have lots of uh, fine art reproduction houses, <clears throat> and a lot of them do the capture as well. So if any of you are artists or doing fine art capture for artists, and th that art is, the lion's share of it is being output on these Epson inkjet printers, and you wonder why you can't print these saturated reds and stuff, um, is because the, the image is prepared in the wrong color space. Dan, I know that um, it's often recommended to work in ProPhoto RGB when we're in uh, Photoshop, but our cameras capture only Adobe, even in 14-bit RAW, right? They're outputting Adobe RGB, right? No. Misconception. Uh, they're tagging the image with sRGB or Adobe RGB, but 
now and, and thank you for bringing that up because that segues me right into the camera color spaces. So I'm going to turn off the Epson color space and I'm going to turn on the Adobe RGB color space. And now I shoot with a Nikon D750. So <clears throat> I have two profiles in here that I created of my D750 with two different software programs. And then I have the canned or default ones that ship with uh, some of the raw developers. I got these two from Capture One software. So when you install Capture One, it installs all the ICC profiles for all the different camera models. I can actually show that to you. Here's Capture One. And right here under the base characterization on the right, it asks for the ICC profile. So here in, in the ICC profile, you have all the camera manufacturers here. Here's the Nikon and here's the D750. So it ships with eight different ICC profiles uh, for that particular camera model. I have the standard one and the vivid one. And you can see as I roll through these, you know, they make the image look different because they're different color spaces. But these are ICC profiles. These are just canned or default ones. They're of a, a generic D750. They're not of your D750 with your lens on it. So <clears throat> these are, you know, a good default, but not as good as creating one yourself. So now we're gonna take a look at these profiles, the standard, the vivid, and the two that I created. So here's the standard Nikon ICC profile. You see clearly that that is not capturing Adobe RGB. Adobe RGB is this line. See that? It's capturing way more pinks, way more blues, way more pinks all the way into reds here. Well, it's actually capturing a little less oranges but more yellows or yellowy oranges. Um, and over here, well, that's Adobe RGB sticking out here. Adobe RGB is actually much larger on the yellow to green side than our sensor is even capturing. So <clears throat> just because you can tag images with sRGB and Adobe RGB in the camera does not mean that the camera is capturing only that color space. You have to create these profiles of your cameras to have a better definition. Um, and this will eliminate a lot of color correction because once you have a definition of your particular camera and, and, and lens combination, it's super accurate. And once you apply that to the image, and I have some examples that I'll show you, I'll show you data statistics, and I'll show you visually uh, the application of these same profiles that we're looking at. So this is the standard profile here. I'm gonna turn off Adobe RGB just for now. This is the vivid ICC profile. Again, quite different than the standard. And then the ones I created are even different than that because these were created from my camera with my lens and my lighting. So you can see it's not even close to the shape of the canned ones, right? I'll turn it on and off again. See this? It's not even close to the same shape. It's actually capturing way out here in this range. Now, and it's not capturing way out here in this range, you know? Uh, so those canned profiles are really, you know, I mean, now, if you happen to like the image in that color space, by all means, use that color space. But if you're talking about capturing accuracy, not just pleasing color, not just pretty pictures, but color accurate, having a definition of your own camera is quite different than 
the definitions that ship with your raw developer. <clears throat> so this is one I created in a product called uh, Color Burst, which is right there in DC. They're like in Sterling, Virginia. Um, and they do a lot of work with, you know, the Library of Congress and some of the government agencies, but their product is called SpectraCore uh, Camera Profiler. So this profile here, and I'm going to turn off the two default profiles. So this profile here is of my camera created with the Colorburst SpectraCore software. And then this profile here was created with the Basic Color Input 6 software, which is made in Germany or Denmark. Um, so, you know, even the same camera getting profiled through two different softwares didn't yield the same result. Uh, now, they have some really high-end functionality in the basic color software that I utilized here that I didn't utilize here. So, you know, bottom line is what I'm trying to point out is my two custom uh, camera profiles are very different than the two CAN profiles. So what is this, how does this affect an image? You know, we're looking at these graphs and you know, hopefully you're grasping the theory. And, uh, but what does this, you know, really mean in terms of what an image looks like? So I'm gonna go down to Photoshop and I've got a, a reference image uh, of course, I didn't shoot these images. This is a, a reference set of images that are for color evaluation, visual evaluation. <clears throat> and I'm going to use Photoshop tools to apply those same profiles that we were looking at. So I'm going to go ahead and do this under the edit menu, under assign profile. This is where the workflow starts or how you're able to start your RGB image and say, hey, this is where this image came from. Now you can take it from there. So I'm gonna go into a sign profile. And I'm gonna choose, this is the Nikon standard profile. And I can see how that applies. Now, again, if I just love how this looks and, I, and that's what I want, then fine, that, that profile is, is good. Uh, but that's a subjective good, not a color accuracy good. So, you know, uh, there's people that are using ICC profiles that give them results that they like, and that's totally fine. But people that are trying to just do color accuracy uh, and not just pretty pictures. This isn't fun. Require a lot of color correction from here to get this to match the original. So I'm going to switch that now to the vivid one, and you'll see the preview change. And then I'll switch this from those two canned or default profiles to some of the ones that I built. Here's one. Now, when you look at those before and after, you kind of go, well, I like the one before that one. <laughs> you know, but that's a personal preference thing. <clears throat> and of course, you and I weren't there when they were shooting this stuff. We don't know what it was actually supposed to look like. But <clears throat> in terms of the math and science, that is the best uh, rendition of that image possible if it was shot with that camera and that lens. Um, so uh, there's one of them there and the other custom profiles here, which that one color wise is about the same. I notice more of the differences in the gradations and the tonality than I do in the color for this one. So that's, those are the two custom profiles that I had created in two different software programs. Now I did them differently. And of course you can see some differences between the two, 
but just for demonstration purposes, it should be getting the point across uh, perfectly well. <clears throat> so, any questions right now? Let me look in the chat room. Hold on. Yeah, I have a, a question. Can you hear me? I can. Um, what about, you know, you're showing these differences, and what about calibrating the monitor and how the monitor gets calibrated that it must be done before you see all these differences? Yes, uh, definitely excellent point. I think, you know, we've probably all walked into like a Best Buy or a Costco, and there's a whole wall of TVs there, and they're all on the same channel, but the color's different on each one of them. That's because all these things, your monitor, my monitor, a laptop versus a desktop or a standalone, uh, you know, a cheap monitor versus an expensive monitor, they're all gonna show you a different color. And that's why we need to calibrate these displays so that, you know, they're consistent and accurate. Um, now, a calibrated monitor alone doesn't give you an accurate idea of how it's gonna print. Um, but this is a calibrated display. I calibrated it actually just last week. <clears throat> so what you're seeing on my screen is completely calibrated. One of the ways that, that you can kind of judge that is, for instance, with this image, this image has these grayscale images across the bottom. Now this is an RGB image, but if my monitor wasn't calibrated, those grays might not look neutral gray. They might look warm or cool or not neutral. You know, but that's one of the main functionalities of doing a monitor calibration is that it's going to get all the gray balance on the display perfectly neutral uh, so that when you define your color space, it can plot everything and preview it to you accurately. Um, now, you know, there's different products in terms of measurement devices. I'll just point out on our website, you know, on entry level solution, you're probably familiar with like the Color Vision Spider or, you know, the X-Rite Color Monkey. Uh, those are, you know, decent. Um, you know, we have, uh, we, we really don't promote some of the entry level products. We kind of start with the, the bottom of the line professional grade stuff, but uh, should you look here, I think it's page two. This device right here, the i1 Display Pro, that's a very capable professional grade colorimeter. So this is a color measurement device, but this does not have a light source in it. So this would not enable you to create a profile of a printer, uh, but it would let you create a profile of a monitor. So <clears throat> if all you needed to do was calibrate your monitor, you know, you could get a color measurement device like this colorimeter for $285 or something lesser like the spider or the color monkey or some way of calibrating your display. Uh, you know, when you get into the professional grade products, like we sell these ASO and NEC professional graphics displays. So when you get into this kind of level of product, this has a, a colorimeter built into it. So you can see here the little, that little thing that's sticking up is a colorimeter that's built into the bezel of the monitor. So it's actually, and you can schedule it so you can automate this whole process. So, you know, hey, I know these are expensive, um, but, you know, it's top of the line grade components. It's showing you 99% of Adobe RGB. Uh, there's no differentiation across the face of the display, and it's got a colorimeter that comes with it that's built in that can just pop up every week, every month and run a calibration automatically based on whatever settings you want it to. Um, so, <clears throat> enough about that. 
Hey, so Dan, I got a couple of questions in the chat here. Uh, yep. The first question from Jay says, if your if your camera profile is right, should we ignore the display? Question mark. Well, it's it, it, it's not one or the other. Um, if you have, to get the best, you know, you need a, a good camera profile and a good monitor calibration and profile, and the combination of those two will yield the most accurate image and preview of image. Terrific. Second question was from Mary. She says, what color space are Canon RAW files? Any, any idea what Canon shoots, guys? Well, that's a good uh, question. And if she could tell me, we could look right in Capture One. So again, that camera, you're going to be able to tag the images with sRGB or Adobe RGB. But if we look over in Capture One, and I go to the profiles here down to Canon, I don't know what model she has. You can see some of these only have one profile, but like right. the EOS 7D Mark II, there's two. The EOS 40D, there's two. Most of the Canons, it looks like just have one profile that they are shipping with. Mm. Well, All here's right. this one had a sunset and a generic, the EOS D30. She's saying she has a 5D4. Okay, so 5D Mark III, Mark IV, right there. Only one. Okay. Only one ships with Phase One Capture One. Um, but I, you know, and we could go grab that profile and look at it in a gamut viewer and compare it to Adobe RGB and say, oh yeah, that's, that's not shooting in Adobe RGB. That's its own color space altogether. Right. Right. You know? Okay. So the next question is, um, Phil Powell is asking if he doesn't print like through an Epson printer, um, does he need to use a color profile when sending his work to a lab? Well, yes, yes, because, you know, because there's all these different color spaces, we always want to embed that color space in our images so that when we give them to other people, they can honor the profiles that we were using. So, for instance, if I'm going to, and let's, that's a perfect opportunity to get into talking about the Photoshop color settings. So I know that you wanted to take a break at you know, 8.05, and I think I can cover uh, these color settings uh, before break here. So yeah. let's look at Adobe Photoshop again. I was showing you here how to assign a profile, but let's go in and look at the actual color settings. These two are right next to each other under the edit menu. We were looking at assign profile, but let's go in and look at the color settings. So. Normally, I, I have mine customized. You can see here Dan's freaking awesome color settings. <laughs> <clears throat> see, it's, you know, it's a lot about the comedy for me, and you guys just aren't getting it. Or maybe I'm just not funny. I don't know. Um, but anyway, um, when, you, when you first install Photoshop, this will be set to North American general purpose defaults. So it'll be set to sRGB for RGB, and it'll be set to US web coded swap V2. Both of these profiles are ancient and not really legitimate anymore. I mean, these are not the best choices unequivocally by far, but Adobe, you know, when Adobe introduced ICC support in like 1995 or six, that was Photoshop version five, I think. Um, these are the two color spaces they chose at the time and they've never changed them. You know, our, our, our RGB devices have come a million miles. Our printing CMYK devices have come a million miles. The standards for all these things have come a million miles. There's new profiles that, you know, available uh, that uh, should be in here but most people don't realize and they trust Adobe. You know, they think, oh, well, Adobe's got these set optimally for me. No, they don't. They're hurting you. 
Uh, so every time you convert an image to CMYK, it's using this US web coded swap V2. What if you're converting an image for an Epson printer that has a huge gamut? Well, you just threw away half the color that you could have printed on that device um, because you just don't understand the theory of color management. Um, so in any case, I change this to Profoto and I already showed you why. Because Adobe RGB is bigger than sRGB, but it's still not bigger than my printer. I need an RGB space that covers my printer color space. Um, and for those of you posting on the web and think that sRGB is still most appropriate for your social media posts or your website posts, unequivocally not true. There's another color space. So what is sRGB? I don't know if anybody knows this, but sRGB was the average CRT monitor color space. Remember the CRT monitors, those big honking yep. tube, you know, things that you would take up half your desk with. <laughs> so that's how old this profile is. This profile was intended to be the average of cheap CRT display. I mean, do any of you have a CRT display anymore? No. Which, no. which brings me to a question that's on the, on the chat board. Um, is there any difference between a desktop monitor versus a laptop monitor? Can you get good color calibration from a laptop? Uh, well, I would say as a general statement, the laptop is going to be a smaller gamut than the desktop. Uh, but that's why we use a gamut viewer, you know, so that we can take a profile of the laptop and or take a profile of the laptop monitor, take a profile of the desktop monitor, compare the two and say, oh, wow, th this monitor has a huge gamut compared to this other monitor. You know, if I'm doing serious color work, I need to be on a desktop display, not on a laptop display, you know. <laughs> now, you know, is an Acer a uh, PC laptop screen comparable to a MacBook Pro screen? No, you know, but is a $200 Acer desktop monitor comparable to a $2,000 Azo monitor? No, you know, you're gonna get what you pay for. Um, and that is, uh, you know, if you want a display that's gonna show you 99% of Adobe RGB, you need to seek one out and the specifications for that display needs to say so. Um, and you're going to pay, it's going to be a professional graphics display and you're going to pay a thousand dollars for a 24 inch monitor, but it's going to be a damn good 24 inch monitor. Um, so that answers that question. Yay. Yes, it does. <laughs> so, so what I'm getting at though is, you know, lots of people looking at photos on, on their, smartphones and their tablets as well. And so this profile here, which is now shipping with Photoshop. So if you're running current versions of uh, Creative Cloud, you'll see this, it's either called uh, Image P3 or uh, Device P3. Uh, they have it named different, I've seen different versions of the profile. It's the same color space. It's the same profile that says P3 in it. Um, that is basically the new version of sRGB. That is a color space that was developed around the average smartphone screen, tablet screen, LED or LCD monitor screen. So you will notice a huge difference. So when you're in your color settings, you want to pick a color space that's appropriate for the work you're doing. Now, maybe one day you're doing web work and the other day you're doing print work. And maybe some of it's gicle and some of it's going on offset. So you have to know all these different things so that you can prepare your image in the right color space. But what we don't want to do is cut it off and limit before we go to the next level. So that's why I like Profoto RGB. And that's what I have set in my color settings is Profoto RGB. And I showed you the gamut plots of that later or before. 
so, but another big thing, and if you're not in the CMYK world, doesn't really matter. Um, you know, I changed that though from that US web coded swap that's 25 years old to something newer. Um, this coded Grackle of 2006 would be the newest good choice uh, that, that Photoshop ships with. There is a 2013 version of this color space that you could download and, and, and install, which I have down here. Um, but that doesn't ship with the product. So the other big thing that I want to point out here is these error messages. Notice that when you're on the general purpose defaults, the profile mismatch and the missing profile error messages are turned off. So I don't, I don't want that. I, and all of you should want to know what's happening to your images under the hood. And these error messages will tell you. So for instance, I'm switching back to my color settings, which have those turned on. And when I open an image, if it has an embedded profile, uh, what do I want to use here? Well, I got to open an image. I'll just close this one and open it again. Oh, I get an error message. Because I have that checkbox turned on. And it's saying, hey, the image that you're opening is in Adobe RGB, but you have Profoto set. So what do you want to do? And the default choice is use the embedded profile instead of the working space, which is what you want to do. So you as the content creator, the photographer, you know, who captured that image and you know what color space you prepared the image in, when you save the image, you embed that color profile into the image. That way, when I open it up, it says, hey, they were using a different color space than you were using. And I use the same one they were using. And if we both have calibrated monitors, we're seeing the same thing. Cool. So real quick, Dan, we'll take a quick break here, but I have a couple quick questions for you. Um, people are asking about these other color calibrating uh, monitor devices like Color Monkey. Um, oh gosh, where's the other one? They're just asking, the are those, yeah, the spider, are those guys any good? You, you don't have any problem with those, I'm assuming. They're entry well, level, but. No, I mean, we sell X-Rate products and the Color Monkey was, uh, you know, kind of the top of the prosumer line, whereas the i1 Display Pro is like the bottom of the professional grade line. It's really the same enclosure and the same optics and stuff. The main difference is the software that comes with it. It's almost the same instrument, the i1 Display Pro and the, the Color Monkey, um, the Color Monkey Display. Um, and I have never worked for a Color Vision uh, dealer, but the Spider products, I know they have, you know, some, they, I know they make good products. That's uh, Data Color or Color Vision. Data um, Color. Data Color, yeah. Data Color is a you know great company making quality products. I would say that you know in that two hundred dollar range, anything less than that I think would probably be suspect. Um, I think you know you're going to spend about two hundred and fifty bucks for, and it's it's not it's a combination of the hardware and the software. So, uh, hopefully that answered that question. Yeah. Okay. Terrific. Why don't we take a five minute, five or 10 minute break here? Uh, why, don't we enter, why don't we come back at 8.15? Let's make it 10 minutes. Bruce can go get his coffee uh, and bagels. And then I'll have another question when you come back and we'll start over. We'll start back up in 15 minutes. Okay, doke. All right, thanks. Yep. Buckle up. Buckle up for round two or hour two. Um, so, so Dan, before we begin, guys, if this is interactive, so if you have questions, 
please ask them. There's a lot of questions in the, the chat room, which I will answer or ask Dan at the end of the program. Um, but if you have a, a burning question during this program, please feel free to jump in and ask that question. Um, so great just, information so far, Dan. We really appreciate it. So if you want to get started, let's continue. Can, can okay, I, great. Can you hear me? Hello? Yep. Yes, Paul. Are you going to be doing a demonstration of camera calibration or would you make a recommendation to go to any YouTube site to do that? Yeah, I'm not really, I have all the information. We just probably don't have enough time. I think we're probably getting more technical than everybody wants anyway. So, uh, but I would point you to basic color input. Uh, basic color is the name of the company. Input six is the name of the product. Um, they have a trial version available on their website. They have a regular and a pro version. Uh, one's like 550 bucks. The other one is 700 bucks. Um, the, the alternative is color burst, uh, is the name of the company right there in Sterling, Virginia. Uh, and their product is called spectra core camera profiler. Um, and now there's a big caveat there. So we have a bunch of people who use Adobe Lightroom, Adobe, you know, camera raw plugin, Adobe uh, Bridge to process their raw files. And with the Adobe apps, it, they don't support ICC profiles. They support a different flavor of profile. It's called a DMG or DCP, digital camera profile. It's also referred to as a raw profile. Um, but all the Adobe uh, camera raw plugin, Bridge, and Lightroom only support DNG profiles. So if you so need, Dan, if, uh, uh, yes. So Dan, you can use the uh, color checker to uh, generate a profile. DNG. Yeah. So although I, I've, you are correct, there's a, there's an entry level product called uh, it's Passport, uh, the X Rite product. I've tested it and I can't get a very good profile out of it. So while oh. yes, you're right, you know, that's, a, that's like the entry level one. I think that's probably the most mainstream one that people have tried, but in all my testing, I can't get accurate profiles out of there. Um, so I've had, I've had much better success with these other two and the color burst uh, spectra core now it only does ICC profiles, but it's it's cheaper too. It's like two ninety nine or it's three hundred bucks. So, <clears throat> but if you need to do DNG and or ICC professional grade uh, camera profiles, uh, Basic Color Input Six is kind of the flagship product there. Um, now I've spoken with Color Burst, and he's supposed to be uh, adding the DNG profile functionality in. Uh, the, you know, then he's going to offer that, you know, he said it'll probably be, could be six months. So I think in the future, you'll be able to do DNG profiles out of the basic color product. But as of today, it's strictly ICC, which would work fine for you if you're using phase one capture one or another raw developer that used ICC profiles. But if you're in the Adobe camp, you really need a, a, a software that'll create DNG or DCP slash raw uh, profiles. So does that answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, so I just finish up with what I was talking about on the Photoshop side, and then I'll show you some Lightroom stuff as well as how to soft proof in both so you can get an accurate preview of what the file's gonna look like when it prints. Again, we need the definition of the, the printer ICC profile when we do that. So locating those profiles or having them easily accessible is important. So in any case, I showed you that I turned on those error messages in my color settings. And now I've opened an image and that image is in a different color space than I have my color settings set to. And it's given me a warning, but it's gonna use by default the embedded profile, which is what should happen. So when I open this, it's going to preview it to me in Adobe RGB, not in Profoto RGB. 
So, <clears throat> but if you wanted to also visualize the difference between, now we saw the gamuts, we saw the uh, 3D gamut plots of sRGB versus Adobe RGB. Here's a reference image that's in Adobe RGB right now. And if I went into the edit menu and assigned a different profile, it's not changing any of the pixel values, it's only changing the preview. So when I go in here and I choose sRGB here, look at how much flatter this is, less saturated. So here's before, here's after. Before, after. So with Adobe RGB, because it's a bigger color space, those pixels can go out further in the color space. Whereas when you convert it to sRGB or assign sRGB, it limits all those pixels within the boundaries of that color space. So you can see, hey, you know, I would much rather have this print like this than like this if I had a choice. Um, but just by preparing the image wrong, you could throw away color that you could have printed. Um, so now if I, if I forget the, if I, if I uh, discard the embedded profile in this case um, and choose Profoto, then it goes, it's like way oversaturated. But this image wasn't prepared initially in that color space. So that's why it looks kind of wonky. Um, so, you know, if we want to see this image the way whoever created it wanted us to see it, we honor the embedded profile. And we, as long as we have a calibrated display, now we're seeing what they were seeing. So now the next part comes in, which is now you want to print this file, right? You want to print this to some kind of printer. Well, these printers, just because they have cyan, magenta, yellow, black ink doesn't mean they print the same. If you looked at the cyan from a Canon printer versus the cyan from an HP or an Epson printer, they're all different colors of cyan. Uh, and they're very blue uh, on the inkjet side, whereas cyan on a traditional printing press is really a cyan color. So just because it's CMYK doesn't mean it's going to reproduce color the same way because the inks are different and the, the chemistries of the inks, the papers they're printing on, it all factors in. So we need to be able to see what this file is going to look like when we print it. And all the Adobe apps now you can do this in. So you can do this, it's called soft proofing. And you can do this in Lightroom. I'll show you how to do it in Lightroom. I'm going to show you right now how to do it in Photoshop. You can also do it in, in Illustrator, in InDesign, in Acrobat. Uh, so whether you have an image or a vector graphic or a document, you can do this soft proofing to see what it's going to look like when it prints. So under the view menu, it's the very first section here, proof setup. And under custom is where you configure it. So you go to custom. And now you need the ICC profile of the printing machine. And, you know, as a photographer, you're like, I don't know what printing profile they're going to, well, there's no way that you can really accurately soft proof your images unless you have the definition of how that printer prints. So to me, you know, the really, the, the, the photo labs or printing companies that have their profiles available for people so that they can utilize them in this way are the ones that, you know, you're going to get the best results from because they really know what they're doing. Um, so in any case, I have a profile of an Epson printer uh, that I want to use. I think it's in here. Yeah, right here. So this is, this is the same one that we were looking at in Color Think in the Gamut Viewer. This is the, a brand new Epson 7500. Um, so Dan, and we share your screen again. I'm seeing you got your screen. Uh, new share. Boom. Did that work? Uh, not yet. I, I think it's your problem, Jim, not, uh, not Dan's. So you're seeing the shared screen? We are seeing the shared screen. Okay. I don't know what I did here. Thanks. Hey, no problem. I think you got struck by lightning. Okay, good. That's possible. <laughs> 
Uh, so in any case, once we turn on this device to simulate, it's asking for the ICC profile. This could be um, a, a photo lab, you know, a photographic print machine. It could be, uh, you know, an inkjet. It could be an offset press. And whatever the printing device is, you can create an ICC profile of it and then utilize it in software like this. So I'm choosing this profile. And I think, yeah, never mind. Uh, <clears throat> it's important to turn on then the simulate paper color and simulate black ink. So when I turn this on, you hardly see a difference, right? Look at that. Here, I'm, I'm turning the preview on, off, on, yeah. off, right? You can barely even see a difference because this printer has a huge gamut and it's printing almost all of Adobe RGB. So there's very little loss there whatsoever. But right here, it's still using the white point and the black point from the uh, image color space. So Adobe RGB, you have to turn on the simulate paper color and simulate black ink to see the difference in the contrast. So it takes into account the color of the paper, the brightness of the paper. And even though you have black ink, the black ink doesn't print pure black. It prints really dark gray. Uh, so you have less contrast and you need to be able to see that. Um, and this is a great way, we haven't talked about rendering intents, but whenever you do any color management, you're always going from one color space to another color space. That's source to destination or input to output. Um, and there's four different methods that you can do that transform and those are called rendering intents. And they'll yield different results. And we can preview the effect of the rendering intent right here. So for instance, take, you know, look at the screen. Right now we're looking at the soft proof in, with the relative colorimetric uh, rendering intent. But watch when I switch that to the perceptual rendering intent. You see the color change, right? I'll switch it back. Here's relative colorimetric, right? Are you able to see that change? Yes. And here's with black point compensation. Now, these images don't have a whole lot of like deep dark blacks that would benefit from black point compensation. But if you've got images that are really dark and you're trying to keep the tonality or the detail in the shadow area, I would always turn on that black point compensation. Um, so the, the, out of the four rendering intents, the perceptual and the relative are by far the most popular. <clears throat> but they yield different results. So that's one of the nice things about this uh, soft proofing ability is when we go to print this, it's going to ask us the same questions. What profile do we want to use? What rendering intent do we want to use? So here it kind of helps us decide visually, like, do I like it like this better? Or do I like it like this better? You know? then you know when you go to print which rendering intent to use because you've already seen the difference between the two. So here's the Adobe RGB without a preview turned on. And here it is soft proofed to the Epson 7500 on premium glossy paper with the relative colorimetric rendering intent with black point compensation turned on. That's how you would describe this uh, as a color professional. And there it is with the preview turned on. So now I know exactly what this is gonna print like. So if it's too dark or too light or not saturated enough or whatever, and I need to edit it, now I can edit it knowing that this is exactly what it's gonna print like. Now, of course that's, you have a, a professional graphics monitor, it's calibrated, you know, and everything's set up properly, um, it will work. Uh, so now, a lot of times people wanna take that print 
off of their Epson printer and hold it up right next to their monitor so they can kind of do a, you know, side by side comparison to, from the digital image to the printed piece. Know that that will never work unless you have are viewing the printed piece under standard lighting, controlled like a light booth. And you can buy a desktop one that's small. Um, but if you expect that that soft proof is going to match the physical piece, then all the lighting in your room is dependent on how that looks. Because color is nothing more than the reflection of the light that we're looking at it under. Um, and the monitor is dialed into a particular temperature, whereas the lighting in your room is not dialed into any particular, let alone this particular temperature. But when you buy a viewing booth, you can buy a viewing booth that's dialed into the same temperature as your display. That way the light is the same color. And then when we look at the color under that light, then it totally jives. And you can actually have a soft proof on your monitor that is, you know, you can hardly tell the difference between it and the printed piece. Any questions there? I'm gonna switch over to Lightroom. So let's talk about, you know, the t first of all, how to soft proof in Lightroom, and but a, a typical workflow uh, for the typical photographer who's not really, you know, they don't need to match a brand logo. They're not trying to, you know, match original artwork. They're shooting portraits, they're shooting landscapes, and good color is plenty for them. Uh, on the beginning side, which is the developing of the, uh, you know, the source image. So when we go to the develop module, now this, depending on what version of Lightroom you're using, the current version moved it to the top of the developer pane. So you have to be in the develop settings, but right here, it's, yours might be set to Adobe Standard. I think it's set to Adobe Standard by default. I use, you know, now here's where you could apply your own camera profile. So now that would have to be a DNG camera profile, not an ICC camera profile. That was a mouthful. Anyway, um, so when you come in here with your raw image and you apply one of these profiles to it, it is completely now ignored sRGB or Adobe RGB and has moved it into one of these profile spaces. The sRGB or Adobe RGB that the image was tagged with from your camera just gets ignored and this gets assigned. Um, so, and these yield different results. So I've got a, you know, panorama there. That's our headquarters is in Portland. So this is the Columbia River Gorge um, that I shot on a cloudy, foggy day. Um, so, you know, I have processed this with the color profile, but if you look at the landscape profile, you can see the color change. So this is like the first part of the workflow. You shoot the images, you copy them and start developing them. And the top thing in the developer pane is not only the histogram, but what color space you're using. So again, you know, these are good presets. I have shot thousands and thousands of images where I've only used these presets, you know, and then I tweak from there to make it look however I want to make it look. It doesn't need to be color accurate. It needs to be however I want it to look, right? So can I interrupt? Um, when you yep. switch, let's say now you, you set it to Adobe Landscape, and then you switch over into Photoshop. What, well, what color space is it going to pick up? The one that you I'll switch show. over from? Or that what is in the have? preferences. So if you go to the Lightroom Classic Preferences, let me move this down. Under File Handling, is that it? No. External Editing, right there is what color space it's then going to open it in Photoshop. 
Hey, Dan. Yep. If you were to start with the raw file, I'm assuming you should just switch it to the pro photo RGB. Is there anything else I should do before that or? No, because now this is only once you go out of here, because right, right in the, if we're just looking at the developer pane, we got yeah. the raw file right here and it's being previewed to us in one of these color spaces. Right. So let's say there's vivid. Now, if I right click this and say edit in Photoshop, now it's going to refer to whatever I have set in my preferences under, under external editing. So you can say when, when it says edit in Photoshop 2020, it's going to automatically open this as a TIFF in whatever color space I want. Okay. So we should... in 8-bit or 16-bit, whatever resolution I want and with or without, comp, uh, you know, uh, compression. Hmm. I didn't realize I have my compression turned on there. I, I don't think it really matters with the zip, but, uh, it, you know, or I mean a TIFF, but. Hey, I'm Dan. I have a question for you. This is Kenny. Yep. So, okay, so we're in the development model, module, and we're ch choosing one of the color spaces. Isn't it a little confusing that we pick one color space and then we go into um, Photoshop and now it's changing it? So when it when it returns back into Lightroom, what is it returning back into? Well, keep in mind, as soon as you export, it goes to TIFF format, mm -hmm. and then when it comes back to Lightroom, it'll be a TIFF in Pro Photo. Yeah, but but in your but in your example in in developing, let's say you put it into let's say Vivid, yep. or which is which is not um, a, well let's let's say Adobe color so yeah, that's adobe the one color, i usually use is adobe color is adobe color similar to if we change when once it changed over to photoshop is that in a different color spacing well yeah but all the colors you know it'll move into this other color space but all the pixel values will maintain what you see here okay um because I didn't know if I, if I moved it to uh, uh, Photoshop, if it's going to change the color spacing. Nope, no, nope. it's going to refer to whatever set in preferences here, unless you do export. This would be if you do the edit, you know, like if you right click and say edit in Photoshop, mm -hmm. that's where you set that is in your preferences under external editor. But if you go to export, the, the settings are right here in the export window. So um, right here is the file format and color space. For mm -hmm. Now, normally when I'm exporting here, I'm exporting a JPEG. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but I would set that to JPEG. And then I'm using, you see here how that profile is called display P3. Right. But in Photoshop, it's called image P3. Correct. That's the profile of, that I would use for any of my online stuff. Any social media posts, any website content. Um, this is a bigger color space than sRGB. Your work will look more colorful uh, in this color space. But for print, it's still not big enough. And we know that this one is still not big enough. These are in order of size. So this is the smallest, then this is the next size up, next size up, and this is the largest. And these are four like international standard color spaces. Um, so the, I would use Pro Photo RGB just so I didn't clip any colors because mm -hmm. from there, I'm going to go to my Epson profile and I just want to print everything that's in my raw file. Does the printer recognize the Pro Photo RGB when you, when you send it out for print? Yes. Now, you know, I've heard of, sometimes that uh, like a printer, they don't use this, that, that, that profile. Well, in a, in a perfect world, this is what this is for. We embed our color spaces in our images so that when we pass them along, they get honored, you know? Okay. Now, any RIP software, most of these labs have a software program in front of the printer. They're not just printing to it through a driver. They have a RIP software and the RIP software unequivocally has the ability to honor the embedded profile. Whether they have it set up to honor the embedded profile 
is based on how knowledgeable they are about printing and color management. Okay, so, so basically you say we should be working in Adobe Photo, Adobe RGB. Well, I don't, I, I mean, certainly when we looked at in ColorThink at, uh, I have to turn these on again just so you can see. Um, here's Adobe RGB. If your photo lab or you or whoever was printing this was printing this with an Epson printer, I mean, you can see how much that you're going to clip that. So mm -hmm. no, Adobe RGB would not suffice. I mean, I'm in pro, pro yeah, photo. Yeah, pro photo. Pro photo would totally cover this whole thing so that we are not clipping any colors before we print. Uh, let me turn off Adobe RGB. Boop. That's Pro Photo versus a new seven color Epson. And you can see we're, we're clipping nothing. Mm -hmm. So that, I mean, that's the scientific argument for Pro Photo RGB. Um, hey. Hey. So in any case, uh, two things here. I know we're kind of getting low on time, but... Um, <clears throat> So right here, though, is where you can browse out and grab your DNG profile. So you can, you know, go grab profiles that you've created. But otherwise, if you don't have any profiles that you've created, it's not like Capture One. You saw in Capture One where when I went to choose a profile, it was like listed every camera and had a profile for every kind of Canon, every kind of Nikon, you know, it was like, oh my God, Lightroom's a little bit different. You know, they have the, they, it's made to be easier, you know, and it suits a giant portion of photographers just fine. They don't need to get into that minutia. You know, they just, you know, apply this profile, say, hey, that's about what it looked like, or that's what I want it to look like. I'm happy with that. But we'll Damn. just take it from there. Dan, yep. hello. So, but if lower on the the Lightroom panel, and select the camera and lens that you, the color space changes on the monitor. So you're talking about the lens correction here? Yeah. Before, if you uncheck the, if you uncheck those, typically I've noticed that the color space changes. Yeah, I wouldn't say the color space changes, but I do see the color change. But, you know, that's also too because it's kind of warping it and adjusting for the lens, you know, particular lens that you're using. So overall though, turning that on and off, it doesn't change the color space, but it may change the color depending on its adjustment for the lens. But here's the profile you're talking about. This is not an ICC profile. That's a lens profile. Hey, Dan. Yep. So when we're in Photoshop, we should try to change it to ProPhoto sRGB to start before making changes? Uh, if you were creating RGB images in there, yeah. You can just go into your uh, color settings and, and, set, and you can save different settings. So if you wanted settings for sRGB and Adobe RGB and Profoto RGB, you can go back in there and change them, or you can save them as presets and just switch back and forth between them. Um, I have mine just permanently set on Profoto, um, but depending on what I'm doing, I might use Adobe RGB as well, as long as it covered the color, color space of the next device I was going to. Um, Thanks. Yep. Uh, so, so Dan, Dan yep. one other thing, back to color checker. So, mm -hmm. You know, the color checker image that you hold, so you hold your color checker in front of your subject. Yep. Take a picture of that. And then when you get in the Lightroom, you can calibrate using the, through using color checker software, the image. And you're saying that that's not very good. It, it, the software that creates, this is Color Checker Passport is what you're talking about. Correct, yes. And the Color Checker 
charts. So Correct. they have several different charts. So if you're talking about this chart right here, uh, well, this I'm is actually the regular, talking about the next one over. It's a little better. Yeah, Back. the passport. Right. You know, first of all, this only has 24 patches in it, you know? So it doesn't have enough color information to create a good profile and their software isn't great. Now we sell x right. Some of their stuff is awesome. This is not awesome. Um, but if you, you know, when you get into camera profiling and talk about different charts, the color checker digital SG chart See how many patches and how many colors that has in it? You're gonna create a much better camera profile with a chart like this than you are with a, the passport chart. The passport chart just has these patches right here. It's like these right here, 24 patches. It's actually these rows, straight down here, across the bottom, up and over. Those patches right there are in the passport that you're talking about and but look at how many other colors are in the digital sg chart so but i think that i think the color checker passport i mean it's it's target like audience and the target use is is somewhat different right i mean the, yeah. the passport is just you know you're getting skin tones right and you're yep. basically doing better with the lighting yep. and things like that so it does its yep. thing right yep for sure yeah, all of this stuff is kind of like, well, you know, what are your needs? You know, what's your budget? I mean, because it goes on and on and on. Uh, so, you know, I think the Color Checker Passport is a cool product for, you know, entry-level results. <clears throat> um, but when you're, like, doing fine art reproduction or trying to shoot commercial items, you know, a branded, whether it's apparel or you know, product or whatever, and it has to be dead on, then it's not enough. Uh, and at that point, you need a better chart, you need better software to create a better profile. Cool? Cool. Uh, so let me show you here in, again, you have to be in the develop module in Lightroom, but you can do the same soft proof so here's soft proofing and say show proof. And then on the side over in the develop pane, notice that you have this new section here that shows up. And you can create a proof copy, which is a virtual copy of, it's really, you know, uh, just showing you the image in another color space. Um, and it's really just the preview of the image. So it's got the raw file as the master, and then it's got you know previewed in, previews that are converted to different color spaces. But in here, you can choose an ICC profile. So if I say other, here's that Epson profile that we've been talking about, the seven color Epson. Say okay to that. I can choose my rendering intent, so I can see. Do, do I like it better with relative, or do I like it better with perceptual? And I've got that check mark to turn on the simulate white paper white and simulate ink black. So I can really see what this image is gonna print like now. And now if I wanna use any of the editing tools here in, uh, in Lightroom, I can. Or if I need to take this to Photoshop, I can edit in Photoshop. And the way that we have this set up is as soon as I do this, it's gonna create a TIFF in ProPhoto RGB and take that right into, uh, into Photoshop. So that's kind of, you know, the majority of what I wanted to show you guys. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to, to, you know, one thing we didn't talk about was the print dialog box out of Photoshop. Most of us, even though you can print out a Lightroom, I find that most people would open their image in Photoshop and print it out of Photoshop. Uh, so I'm gonna show it to you in Photoshop. So if we are ready to print our image here, and notice when we soft proof this, I wanted to point one other thing out. I got, you can, you know how 
at the top here, you can see the tab. You know, the tab has things in parentheses. Can you see that where it says Roman 9? Now, Roman 9 Adobe RGB is part of the name of the file. Are you guys seeing that at the top here? Yep. Yes. And then it says parentheses RGB slash 8 star. And you're like, uh, okay, it's in RGB. The 8 is 8-bit. 8 so if it was 16-bit, that would say 16 there. And star means that it's being previewed in a color space that differs from what you have set in your color settings. Remember when we opened this up, we got an error message that said, the image is in Adobe RGB, you have Profoto set. So it's telling us that it's previewing it to us in a different color space, the honoring the embedded space over our color setting space. And then it has another slash that has the name of the profile that we're soft proofing it to. So now that this has been soft proofed, you know, and I know exactly what it's gonna look like when I print it, and I've adjusted it however I want to adjust it, and now I want to print it. So when I go to File Print, and it's important how this is set up. So first of all, down here at the bottom, the Match Print Colors, that's the soft proofing here. So again, this Match Print Colors has nothing to do with the printing of the file. This only has to do with the preview image that we're looking at here. So if you want that preview to be accurate, you turn this on and it soft proofs it. And then over here, <clears throat> it's telling you the document profile. It's saying, hey, this image is in Adobe RGB and you wanna take it to another color space. So you can have printer manages color or Photoshop manages color. For the most part, there I can't think of any other reasons. This should be set to Photoshop manages color and turned off in the printer driver. So then here is the profile that we're using, the Epson 7 color premium glossy. And here's the rendering intent, perceptual or relative. And I thought I liked relative better and I've got black point compensation turned on. <clears throat> now, this is for normal printing. This is how you would print a, a pretty picture. You just want the most colorful, beautiful image that you can print. If you wanted this to look like, if, if it was a proof, when I say a proof, that means it matches another device. So let's say you wanted to use your Epson which was capable of printing a huge gamut of colors, but you wanted to use it as a proofer, which means it would look like, you know, Joe printing's offset CMYK press. Then you could also do hard proofing here instead, and it would give you another profile to choose. And that could be from a custom setup, or you could just grab that from the working space which that went back to my color settings and chose the grackle profile that I had set there. And then I can do hard proofing. You know, I don't know how many of, of the photographers are doing CMYK proofing with their Epsons. Normally they're just doing the normal printing and they're going from image color space to printer color space based on a particular rendering intent. And that's it. Just hit print. And then if you had a viewing booth, you could pull that print, put it in the viewing booth right next to your soft proof monitor and say, wow, those look almost identical. It's crazy. Um, Dan, I have a question for you. This is Kenny again. Yep. And I'm going to ask this question before you move in here. So basically, if we were in Lightroom and we were soft proofing, you said you soft proof and then you make all the corrections you want on that soft proof. So it would match up with the, I guess, the printer that you're gonna be using. Is that correct? Yep. So basically it should be almost identical um, to the printer if you have the IC, ICC profile in there. So I guess my question would be then, should we 
basically saw proof the image and just work with it from there with with the intent of what printer we're going to be using yeah and uh, you know i don't i'm not going to physically convert the image to the epson color space that's going to happen when it prints this is only converting the preview so i'm still leaving the image in its original rgb color space but the, but the soft proofing is supposed to look like what it's going to print like for that particular printer is that correct yep right here uh, so i guess that's what i'm saying is that it seemed like it should be better for us to do soft proofing for the i guess the printer or the the print lab we're going to be using so that we know exactly where we're going to get for sure is that correct Yep. Okay. Yeah, you're not going to know what that prints like if you're not soft proofing it. You know, it's let me turn off the shot soft proof. You know, it's uh you know, it hasn't taken the printing condition into effect yet or into account yet. So I guess that's that's why it's important we have the like I use Nations Photo Lab. So I guess I should be using uh Nations Photo Lab IC, ICC profile then soft proof yeah, I, it then saw proof it and then worked on the saw proof. Yep. Okay. That's, that's what I wanted to know. Yeah. I don't know, you know, if they, uh, if they have instructions on their website or profiles that you can download on their website, I think or they if they, or if they just say, Hey, submit it in Adobe RGB or sRGB and we'll do our best matching it. Hmm. Okay. You know? I, I think, I think nation uh, photo lab, they do have um, IC, ICC profiles. Yeah, I would think that most of the good ones do because as you could see when we looked in color think these new Epson printers are capable of way more color than Adobe RGB. Why would they limit all their customers down to that, you know, that space. It just doesn't make sense, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so especially those labs who know color management and say, uh, -uh we're going to use this Epson space. And they might just put the Epson profile out for you, may, or maybe one they created of their Epson on a particular paper, uh, and then put that on their website and say, this is the definition of how we're going to print your work. Okay. So I know they have like luster print, um, um, pearl, um, pearlized um, paper. So basically, we, it, depending on what paper we're going to be printing on, we should be getting that uh, ICC profile for each paper. Yep. Yeah, they're specific for printer ink paper. Um, and, you know, I, I highly recommend everybody have, you know, some sort of gamut viewer. Like I'm using this Color Think software, but this really gives you a way to throw that ICC profile into something that you can look at the shape of it and size of it and not just apply it in Photoshop and see the visual effect of it. Well, thanks. That was very helpful. You're welcome. Uh, this is Paul again, Dan. Um, how long should we wait after a print uh, to actually see the final color? Because I've heard that it takes time for the, the color to set a bit. Well, that's a good, that's an interesting question. You know, I, I know way more than I care to know about like ink chemistries and, you know, the coatings they use on papers and it goes on and on and on. Um, but I think the mindset is back to the older generations of Epson printers. The first couple series of Epson printers, the ink chemistry just wasn't great. It was not archival quality. It, you know, shifted the color, shifted and faded, you know, over time, almost until it would just disappear, the image. <clears throat> these any of the current you know maybe 10 years worth of epson printers at least the last three four or five generations with their ultra chrome inks are steadfast man i mean they are dry and color steadfast initially right off printing i mean nominal nominal shifts beyond that and you know they say they're archivable for 100 years does that include the 4900? Yeah, yeah, 4900 was uh, ultra chrome pigment based inks. So yeah, yeah, I mean, now if you're a super color geek like I am and we were splitting hairs, 
you know, I could measure stuff right off that 4,900 right when it printed and then wait 30 minutes and measure it again and wait another 30 minutes and, and show you, hey, over two hours that shifted this much. So yeah, it changed a little bit, but no, it's like I said, nominal, nominal difference. You know, when you get into the other kinds of printers, because most of the Epsons we're talking about are indoor inks, but Epson makes the S series printer, which are solvent inks. And those are like popular for car wraps and, you know, all kinds of other types of stuff. A lot of that stuff gets laminated and that those inks need to do what's called outgas. And therefore, you know, with an Epson S series printer, you generally have to kind of let it sit for four to six hours before you laminate it and let the inks out gas. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome. So Dan, um, let's just open it up. If anybody has any questions, uh, let's open it up and see what we got. Uh, I have a question, uh, Rollin here. Um, Dan, I really enjoy this uh, discussion tonight. It's very informative. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, I, I just look take a look at my preferences for setting my color spaces in Photoshop, and I couldn't find that Grackle, was it 521 that you showed? Is that something I can get online? Or yep. Can you? Yeah, if you, uh, a, a quick Google search for okay. uh, Grackle ICC profiles, it's probably grackle.com. Okay. It's idealliance.org. Idea Alliance owns Grackle, but uh, here's these are the ICC profiles for Swap and Grackle 2006 and 2013. So why Adobe isn't shipping the product with the latest standards with their, which are already seven years old? You know, they really don't care about printers, um, apparently, which is not. sad to me. Um, but yeah, they'll, they'll, the, the current versions of Adobe Creative Suite ship with the 2006 standard uh, CMYK profiles. I saw that not, one. But do not ship with the 2013 versions of Swap and Grackle. So you'd have to download those yourself. If you're on a PC, you just right click them and say install and that'll put them in the right folder. <clears throat> on the Mac, they go in your library in ColorSync Profiles. Yeah, yeah, I know how to do that. Uh, if, if you allow me one other quick question. Do you have any yep. comments on having custom paper profiles created by a third party? For example, I have uh, several profiles for a Canon Pro One that are several years old now were created by uh, a place out in California. Who was it? I probably know them. Uh, wait a minute. If you give me a moment here, uh, like... Uh, was it Chromix? Uh, yeah, maybe. I actually, um, yeah, I don't know. Photo Warehouse. Okay, I know lots of the other color geeks around the country. Um, so yeah, I mean, first of all, for you to be able to create your own profiles, you gotta have ICC profiling software, and you gotta have a spectrophotometer, not a colorimeter like the ones we talked about. Those cheap colorimeters are good for do, do creating profiles of monitors, but you can't, it doesn't have a light source in it, so you can't create a printer profile with a colorimeter. You have to have a spectrophotometer to create that. And an entry level spectrophotometer is like 1400 bucks, you know? Well, and that doesn't the, come with the ICC profiling software. Well, the, color, know, so, monkey, the color monkey was advertised as being able to create print profiles, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, and it would be along the lines of the uh, color checker passport, where I never, you know, I never had much success with it. I know it's it's not a professional grade product. Does it suit a certain por portion of the market segment? Sure, you know. But if you're color critical and you you know are not going to be happy unless it's awesome, then those products are probably going to fall short, you know, in your estimation. Um, not that it doesn't suit some people. Um, but yeah, I mean, you need a spectrophotometer and you need, you know, some ICC profiling software. So you're talking an investment, you know? And if all you need is a profile of one or two papers, you're like, what do I need to spend $2,000 when I need two profiles, you know? 
fine, we do the same thing. We have a remote profiling service. We would send you a chart, help you print it right. You'd ship it to us. We'd measure it with our spectrophotometer, create the ICC profile, and send it back to you. And we do those. We have a couple different ones, but we generally charge $100 a piece. Uh, so you could get two you know, remote profiles done for 200 bucks. Well, that's, that's very reasonable. Thank you for all your, your good work tonight. You're welcome. I enjoy, uh, you know, I eat, live, and breathe this stuff. And, you know, I just recall how difficult it was learning all this myself. And uh, I, I really like teaching people how everything works. Do you make those uh, paper profiles also for Canon printers? Yeah, any printer. Any printer. Could be a, a offset press, toner machine, indigo, any kind of inkjet any kind of printing machine could be on fabric could be on metal doesn't matter so where do we find the information there on your website oh uh, you can just contact me directly um you know i mean we're not like cookie cutter kind of like we'd we never want to be b and h photo or LexJet. we're much more relationship you know uh <laughs> consulting type boutique type outfit so, you know, it's kind of white glove and we handle everybody one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Wow, so, thank you. Uh, my contact information is in there. Uh, I have, uh, and anybody can reach out to me. We yeah. also Dan, have- is it okay uh, if I, Dan, is it okay if I share your phone number as well? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah, and we created a coupon code that you can use on our website, which is aldertech.com. Um, and so, you know, if you're buying ink or paper or software, uh, even some of the hardware, you can utilize a 10% a off code that we created uh, for just for the uh, webinar attendees. What's that code? It's photo 10, photo 10, all caps. Number 10? Yeah. Terrific. Thank you so much for doing that. We really appreciate so, that. Now, don't try and use that code to buy a new printer. Thank we, you. Can't afford, we can't afford to give you 10% off a new printer. We don't even get that kind of margin on the printers. <laughs> but for any of the supplies uh, or some of the softwares and hardwares, um, that'll work. And if you have any trouble, just reach out to me. Terrific. Any other questions for Dan? No, thank you so much. Yeah, uh, Dan, I, it, was, it was fantastic. Um, really loved it. Mind. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, guys and girls. I didn't hear from any of I didn't hear from any of the ladies. There was a couple of questions that I read to you that were from from the women. Okay. Yeah. I said I didn't hear from them. Uh, <laughs> they're yeah. too shy. Thanks. Thanks. It was yeah. great. Oh, there, there's yeah, Sally. Was, uh, Sally's speaking up. Go ahead, Sally. Just the tip of the iceberg. It's where I'm at, man. Well, hey, keep in mind too that we offer remote services. So, you know, if you're like, hey, I'm never going to get this, you know, I need help. You know, we can just tunnel into your computer through the internet. We can help you set up your software. We can print charts that we can create profiles for you for. We can help you remotely. And that's an hourly rate. So you don't have to pay a whole day for me to come on site. Um, and we have several of me that work for my company. So even if you didn't get me, there's a knowledgeable guy right behind me um, that, that can help you with anything without even coming to your location. Awesome. That's perfect. Yeah, that's awesome. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Can we use that 10% coupon code for that one hour consultation? No, not on labor. <laughs> but <I'm> on product. <laughs> yeah, we have to try. We have to try. All right, Maryland PPA, I think we're going to call the night. Uh, tomorrow, we do have print competition at 2 p.m. It starts at 2 p.m., and it's going to be virtually done through Zoom. Um, and I don't have that Zoom information with me, so uh, I'll get that later, and we'll send it out to everybody that is um, signed up for print competition and wants to watch. I think uh, it's actually going to be available off our page on Facebook. Streaming. No, I was, just, I was going to ask if we're going to do a Facebook, Facebook Live. So we're yeah, doing those. Yes, also it'll, be, it'll be Facebook Live, not Zoom. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, Dan, you were like 
I'd also like to invite everybody to follow us on social media. We've got an Instagram, you know, following, LinkedIn following, Facebook and uh, Twitter, uh, and a YouTube channel. So oh, check awesome. out Alder Color Solutions on your favorite platform. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Dan, thank you so very much for your time and talents. We really appreciate it. I know I saw a lot of light bulbs going off in the chat room, and I think uh, people are going to start to think about color a little bit differently. So Rock and roll. Hey, thanks, everybody. Thank Good night. you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.